Uh, people have told me they're coming down, so we will be uh, an august. But we're an august body now, and we will be even fuller at that point. I just want to say a few words about Dr. Wishart. Dr. Ian Wishart was born in Toronto, born and raised in Toronto. He is a graduate of Knox College. Uh, he's also studied in Scotland and Germany. Uh, from 1972 to 1998, he served as Minister of St. Andrews in St. John's, Newfoundland and he's now uh, Minister Emeritus there. Uh, Ian chaired the Committee on Church Doctrine during the 80s, helping to steer the launch of Living Faith, which is now one of our subordinate standards. In 2010, out of his vast experience as a pastoral minister, he published Common Order, a Canadian book of services of worship, which are available to you today. So Ian, I don't want to take up any more of your time, please. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift your hearts up to Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. Let us sing to his praise. And in books, 299. Uh,
Lord God, Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Have mercy on us. You are seated at the right hand of the Father. Receive our prayer. For you alone are the Holy One. You alone are the Lord. You alone are the Most High, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit, in the glory of God the Father. Receive our prayer through Christ our Lord. Amen. This workshop deals with the forms and usages of prayer in the formal context of, of, of a service of worship. There are many books of worship, many books of services of worship. And each denomination of Christians has formulas of worship, and these formulas frequently are the dividing rules which distinguish one denomination from another. In the Presbyterian tradition of worship, the early texts on worship were those of John Calvin in Geneva. The earliest Presbyterian text in English come from John Knox. And in a minute, I've got a copy of John Knox's uh, service book, uh, the Book of Common Order uh, from, from, from John Knox, uh, 1564. And when, my book isn't from 1564, it's, it's a later edition. <laughs> In Canada, the earliest prayer book that I know of is AIDS for Social Worship. Um, and, you know, it, it, it's a, it must be like, anyway, AIDS for Social Worship being short services of prayer and praise for the use of Christians, published in 1900 to serve the needs of settlers in Western Canada where there were no established churches. Uh, it's interesting, one of the people who was very much a part of the worship committee of the Presbyterian Church and was very much instrumental in seeing that that book was published was uh, Sanford Fleming. Now, Sanford Fleming is better known to people because he's the person who established Standard Time and was the one who invented the Standard Time zones of 15, uh, across the world. Uh, he was a a very distinguished engineer, and uh, I guess he was connected with the railway. And among other things, he was concerned for the people settling in Western Canada. But anyway, this is a nice little book, which I, I'll, I'll show you a copy of it. But uh, he's got, and I don't know, I don't know anybody else who got a copy of it. It would be interesting to know if there are people who. Uh, but that was published in 1900. Uh, in 1922, the Presbyterian Church in Canada published a book of common order. And this, 1922, this was at the height of the discussion leading to the formation of the United Church of Canada. And that volume was quickly forgotten both by the Presbyterians and by the United Church people. And as far as I know, Knox College does not have a copy of that book in the library. Um, they have the, if, if you need to get a copy of it, you need to go to a manual. Uh, they, they've got it over there, but I do know that that's it's quite a rare volume. Maybe we could organize a raid <laughs> and get that copy back here. I didn't hear that. <laughs> Sometimes, some, sometimes I'm a little deaf. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm told I need to hear you. So that's a will. We can, we can leave that. Um, then another publication of the Book of Common Order of the Presbyterian Church in Canada was approved by the General Assembly in 1938. And I used to have a copy of that. I don't know. And uh, I think you could yeah, get a copy here. But then there was another book uh, in 1964. Uh, and then, of course, this was followed in 1991 by the Book of Common Worship, which is in the people's hands now. So the focus of my, um, uh, of my discussion here is this volume, 
um, which um, published in 2010. Uh, it, it was based on a series of, I've uh, got a, uh, a smaller volume that I uh, published, uh, that were locally used in 1991. Uh, and uh, uh, actually, for some reason or other, but the the national book thing came out in 1991, but uh, I don't think they used any of my material when they were putting it putting it together. So, uh, but that's all right. Uh, there's some things that I emphasize that they don't, and that's uh, that's is quite understandable. Uh, but anyway, this book uh, has services which I developed in my ministry in Newfoundland, and if you've got a copy of the book. And take a look at it, you'll see all the prayers numbered. And if you look in the back, you find where the sources of those prayers are. Uh, page 160, 150, and following. Uh, and they come from all over the place. Uh, I've got uh, prayers from the Presbyterian Church in Canada, I've got prayers from the Church of Scotland, from the American Presbyterian Church, from the Anglican Church in Canada, from the um, uh, the Church of England in England, from the Episcopal Church in the United States, and the Anglican Church in New Zealand. I've got, um, I've got, and among the prayers I've got from the well, there's a couple of prayers in there, and a few prayers in there from the Church of Scotland. And one of the people, there are several sources from the Church of Scotland, but one of the people who I've got, I do pull, is Duncan McFarlane. And Duncan McFarlane was one of the few people to be twice the moderator of the Church of Scotland. And he was moderator of the Church of Scotland about. Uh, 1818, and in 1843, when the Church of Scotland split, and uh, the Free Church people, Dr. Chalmers, headed across the town to form their own assembly, it was Duncan McFarland who was the, the the moderator of the of the remaining uh, Church of Scotland. And I've got a, a home, great big thick book of family prayers from the from put out by the Church of Scotland, and there is a, there, there is reference to Duncan McFarland in this book, but considerably shortened, considerably shortened, <laughs> yes. Uh, and so, uh, but nonetheless, uh, I, I, I've got that in there. But anyway. I'm suggesting in this that prayers are drawn from many sources in many churches and uh, where possible these are acknowledged so that you can see uh, where uh, and um, my one of the things that I sense in hearing ministers and, is I don't know where the sources of their it, it may be a nice day today, and they're referring to God, but, but the, the ancient liturgy and the, uh, and the form of service uh, gets lost. Uh, and uh, I mean, there, there are a good number of prayers in here which are just from, because I like them. Matter of fact, one of the prayers I like very much is the last prayer of the book. 110. And this was a prayer which my wife, who I regret is no longer with me, but she this was a prayer she wrote for one of the women's groups that was um, that was there. And look, you have to read it here. Oh God, you have bound us together in this bundle of life. Give us to understand how our lives depend upon the courage, the industry, the honesty, the integrity uh, of others, that we may be mindful of their needs, grateful for their faithfulness, 
and faithful in our responsibilities to them. And that's one of the favorite, that's one, that, that's one of my favorite books. That's one of the, <laughs> and, and it was one of these things, it was on a bit of paper, and I wondered where it was and where it was. And I found a Bible, I guess, had been hers, and it was tucked into the Bible. And when it was tucked into the Bible, it went into the book. So that, uh, in other words, I don't mind having prayers in there that come from uh, uh, from the Orthodox Church or or people in uh, or uh, um, or um, or formal traditions. But there are more than a few books of, of prayers in there that are prayers from. But I'm going to say for me. But this one, this was my prayer. This was Jean's prayer, and, and it's one of the things that I like. That I'm very happy about that book. Um, in worship, we talk. In worship, who are we talking to? We're talking to God. In prayer, we're addressing God. We should ask people to join with us in prayer. But then we are all addressing God. And that is why when I begin to talk here about Holy Communion, that In my order, in my lead, the first thing is a prayer of adoration. And that prayer that we had at the beginning, the glory to God in the highest, is one of the ancient prayers of the, uh, 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 of the Christian church, whose origin I don't really know, but you find it in all sorts of literature. But it is a prayer. It is a prayer of adoration. And you know, by and large, in our church, we're not very good at adoration. We pray for God, for God, for God bless us. But lifting up our hearts and our minds to someone. He's here, but he's not here. He's with us, he's with me. He's with you. And we're talking to God. Let us go in prayer. Oh God, you have prepared for all who love you such good things that they surpass our understanding Fill us for, with love for you, so that we may love you more than anything else, so that we may receive what you have promised. And to you, O oh God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, the honor and glory now and throughout the ages. And you'll see, and actually, this is what I'm stressing here. And we're beginning with adoration. We sang today. And you know, in an older day, Presbyterian congregations began with adoration. They sang holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. Probably a great many churches sang it every Sunday at the first. And a while since you've done that, uh, probably, I don't know. But uh, but that is a prayer of adoration. Welcome. And you need a book, and you need one of these little pamphlets. Got the pamphlet. So we're getting on to it. And I'm talking about adoration. You got one of these two, right? Uh, and. I am saying that by
by and large, we don't do adoration very well. We want God to be with us. We are out, perhaps. But the fact that we simply bow before God is where we begin. And then we may talk about well, and, and one of the things that we very often tend to do is to, in a prayer of adoration, and, and we thank you for today, and we thank you for nice weather, and we thank you for this congregation, uh, a prayer of thanks of oh God, how he has affected us. But that's secondary. That comes not first. That comes after this part of our reaction to that. Um, now, the order of uh, Holy Communion that's in here, which you find uh, on page oh, number 136, begins. Now, 136 is the statement about Holy Communion from Living Faith. And then the beginning of the uh, the service of and I repeat, uh, the Lord for all his benefits to me. I lift up my, I lift up the cup of salvation and call on the Lord by name. I pay my vows to the Lord in the presence of all his people. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Happy those who find refuge in him. And then the prayer, which is that prayer as I let us in already. The Gloria and Excelsis, uh, which, uh, Let's see, what are what's the, uh, what do I put down as the origin of that? But one, well, it's just, it's just Gloria and Excelsis with the English language uh, liturgical uh, convention, the, uh, the, the ecumenical texts that have been approved in the last generation so that everybody in English uses them for many things, not necessarily for the Lord's Prayer. Uh, and, uh, uh, and it's difficult to get people saying the Apostles' Creed that way. Some prefer that, uh, you know, why change it? <laughs> and, uh, but, but, uh, but, I mean, these are uh, the, the, the standard texts of the... Uh, and in the book, actually, right at the beginning, there are three versions of the Lord's Prayer, um, one of which is the one of which is the King James Version, which many Presbyterian churches use, but sometimes the person leading the prayer says at the end, forever and ever. And that isn't part of the King James text. Whereas the forever, forever comes in the second one and the list of the Book of Common Prayer. And then there is the final one. This is on page one of the modern text of the Lord's Prayer. But anyway, we begin with uh, with that Gloria and Excelsis, an ancient Greek prayer preserved uh, for use in Roman Catholic and Anglican liturgies and in the modern form adapted by the English language of a liturgical consultation. A superb prayer of adoration and as such it's fitting at the opening of any diet of worship. It's followed by confession, absolution, supplication, the reading of scripture and a sermon in which the good, in which the gospel is preached, and of course, the Eucharist is incomplete without the proclamation of the good news. I sometimes go to Anglican communions, and sometimes there's no word for it. Uh, but on the other hand, sometimes I go to a Presbyterian congregation. And in the service, there's no, uh, there's no statement of faith. There's no creed. There's no this statement of, 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 of what we believe. I don't know why, but you know, it, it, well, I read it when I was growing up. Um, church service, we didn't always. We said the Apostles' Creed once in a while, but you know, the Apostles' Service is not. Um, adoration to God, supplication. We bow before God asking for his blessing upon us in various ways. Something that is very necessary, something that is very proper, but it's not the first thing. It's not where we begin. Um, and then 
in our in our uh, the, the, the general the general practice in churches of the Presbyterian Reformed tradition is to read the words of institution from First Corinthians um, and as a warrant for proceeding. Now it's interesting, you probably know, but in an Anglican service, those, the words from First Corinthians are included in the prayer of consecration uh, as part of the, of the prayer. But it, it's almost, it's very general in the, in, in, in Presbyterian form uh, services that, that we actually read the text from First Corinthians. Although sometimes we read one of the best, one of the passages from one of the Gospels, you could, could do that too. But uh, and normally we, it's the most regular, the most regular one is First Corinthians. And then there is the great prayer of thanksgiving, which in these books is um, 564. And um, it's interesting what we do there. Um, the uh, uh, the long prayer, uh, the great prayer of thanksgiving, and, uh, and this is a pretty standard form of prayer in many in, in all our liturgies, I guess. Uh, this is thanksgiving for Christ and his work. There's what they call the anamnesis and the epiclesis. The anamnesis is our memory of Christ. The epiclesis is our prayer for God's blessing upon what we, upon the elements and what we are doing. And um, it's interesting with regard to that, that um, one of the things that one of the things that's in the uh, in the service and the uh, and I don't know it, it's interesting that it, it was first introduced to us in this book, which is the the pro proclamation of the mystery of faith: Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. It's interesting that is a proclamation that uh, that uh, the source of it is the secretary of the Roman Catholic Church. Uh, and it's recommended in the Book of Praise. Uh, and I, it interests me, uh, I take it it was in, in, an Amer in the Americans, I think the American Presbyterians generally have that. One of the things is the, the Book of um, Praise, it, it gives acknowledgments to the other things are from here or there. And they don't acknowledge the source of that little thing. They don't say, and getting it for my book, I got permission from the Roman Catholics to use. It's interesting. The, the people who were readiest to give me permission to copy prayers from their sources were the Roman Catholics. <laughs> and, and the Presbyterians sometimes were a little old. <laughs> It's interesting that the, 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 when I asked the Roman Catholics to do that, uh, and actually there were some there's some French prayers in there that come from France, and uh, I I got permission from the from the conference of Catholic bishops. Go ahead, use it. So that was very well, but it, it just interests me some other things. But anyway. We remember the work of Christ and plead his sacrifice, and we set this memorial. And, but one of the things in that, it's quite normal in the anamnesis to mention, we give thanks for Christ's birth, his life, his death, his resurrection. And my little, you'll see, I put in there his teaching and wonder why. His teaching is not included in what we remember of the work of Christ. Very essential, but but it's not it's not normally. If you look in most liturgies, it, it mentions his, his birth and his life and his and, and his suffering, his death and his ascension and his promise to come again. But the fact that that he was 
that he was addressed as rabbi. He was our teacher, and uh, uh, that was um, uh, that's what we said before. So the um, uh, and and the other thing is the act of the ap apoplesis. And the one that I normally use, well, anyway, and, uh, and I'll just, and uh, I'll, I'll read the prayer. Gracious God, grant us your presence and pour out your spirit upon us. Sanctify these elements of bread and wine and bless your own ordinance that we by faith may receive the body and blood of Jesus Christ. We often present ourselves to be a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to you. We pray you mercifully to accept our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving. Fulfill in us and in all your people the purpose of your redeeming love. If you look at the Westminster Directory of Public Worship, that first part of the prayer is very close to what is in the Westminster uh, Confession, uh, Westminster Directory of public worship. Sanctify these elements of bread and wine. Bless your own ordinance that we by faith may receive the body and blood of Christ. Now I know that there are some people within our church. Uh, I think that maybe Stephen Ferris doesn't think that we should bless anything because things are not are not you don't bless things. I don't know what he does at that table asking blessing on a, uh, and, and, and he's asked to say grace. Uh, uh, does he say, uh, uh, well, I know, he can always say thank you for this food, thank you to God. But, but nonetheless, there's no question that if you go back to, you know, go back to Calvin, if you go back to the old Presbyterian uh, there is this, the we, the, the prayer is to sanctify these elements of bread and wine and bless your own, 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 order, or own ordinance that we may receive the body and blood of Jesus Christ. Now, um, one thing I want to do is how are we doing for time? Oh, we're doing fine. We're doing fine. And where is, oh, here we go. No, no, that's not it. Where's the other bit that I want to give to you? Guys, has to bless us. Okay, and find it. I thought I had it on paper for you. Anyway, look in your books. Toward the back on page seven. 97. A holy communion and tenebrae for the service for Monday, Thursday. And this is a service for the service at the uh, uh, for Good Friday, remembering the original uh, blessing of Jesus. Brief, but is it, it, it can be a very moving service, and it's this version in here. Is all is based on Matthew's gospel, but I had done uh, other copies of it using other gospels as well. But the Matthew one, I think, is the most uh, most effective. Partly, of, partly because of the of the hymn, the um, uh, uh, which used to I remember always used to be sung at a communion service. Um, it was on that night when doomed to know the eager rage of every foe, that night in which he was betrayed. Um, 
and then ending with the um, uh, with when I survey the wondrous cross. But um, actually, it was on that night. I haven't got that looked up in here. Anyone got it quickly in the book? Uh, uh, Five three seven. Five thirty seven. Five thirty seven. Now I haven't used that. And it says, um, you know, normally, but it's a very, but it, uh, it, it in this service, it's it's a very moving. Uh, you, you sing it through the service and, and then uh, conclude with uh, <laughs> yeah, conclude with when I survey <laughs> no, the wonders for us also for rocking it, also for the same team. So you yeah, you start that and gradually do it through and then finish off with uh, with that. Okay, I've run through the general thing that I wanted to do about as I say adoration comes first. Uh, and uh, uh, is thanksgiving and supplication for God to thank Him for His gifts is uh, His final uh, his, his gifts uh, and His blessing and, and His care for those uh, around us and we. Uh, but um, as I say, and as we've been emphasizing here, the way to say uh, it is adoration. But if you know, I mean, one of the things is you uh, we have praise and thanksgiving. And when it comes to thanksgiving, I'm quite huh? here's, a, here's a prayer of thanksgiving. Let us thank God for apples and apostles. Canada and Cape You know, Cape you know, Daylight and dynamos. Electricity and elephants. Fathers and faith. Gold, God and gold. Hope and hospitals. Insulin and insulation. Jesus and jewels. Kitchens and kindness. Love and lobsters. Mothers and money. Neutrons and neurology. Operations and opera, potatoes and poodles, Quakers and quarters, spirit and space, trout and traffic, uncles and umbrellas, visions and villages, wheels and worship, xylophones and x rays, yellow and yesterday, zinc and zippers. Let us praise God for all his gifts. I'm going to close this section with a hymn, but before we do, a discussion. Where do you want to, as I say, when I was starting and want to anchor it is, of course, in adoration, but what comes after adoration is, uh, is, is well, very necessary. But we lift up our. When we come before God, we worship God. And sometimes, you know, there are prayers offered. You know, a prayer after the sermon. Sometimes you have the prayer that, dear God, bless these people, and did they remember this? And did they remember that? And did they remember the next thing? Um, God had to be reminded uh, what the minister had said in the, in the sermon. 
And so, uh, anyway, there is the tendency in, in services to preach. Same kind of thing, I think, when people give prayers for the children, and they're talking over the children's heads, and they're, they're really talking to the congregation. And uh, uh, now, presumably it helps the children, but, uh, but, but that's not really good. Anyway, I've, I've, that's what I'm talking about here in the first section, and we'll get on to the second one in a little while, but uh, I'd be glad to have your comments. Well, just to, to the importance of, of adoration, because of course the whole service is, is adoration, but if you don't set, if you don't do it right at the start, what's, what's the point? Well, it, 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 yes, but if you don't start right, uh, you, it, uh, I would say at the moment, we don't, there's a real tendency not to do adoration very well. We mix adoration up with the Thanksgiving. We mix adoration up with the needs of the world. Uh, and uh, we, uh, we don't necessarily, we, we're, we're, anyway, I, I just am saying that in modern worship, and I suppose the Presbyterian, I hope the Presbyterian church is better, but I know I go to, the, the, I have services on a regular basis, and it's listed in the bulletin, prayers of adoration and confession. But uh, uh, we have quite a bit of adoration is uh, a very loose term in that regard. Sometimes I've seen it called the prayer of approach. Yes. Mm -hmm. yes. 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 yes, and at least that's being honest. You're, yeah. you know, <laughs> good, yes. Yeah. Uh, dear Lord, good morning, God, God and we're, we're delighted to be here in your presence. Uh, you know, we're, we're, we're saying hello. But, yeah. <laughs> there, there's nothing set though. You know, and like I, I do public supply all over the place. I'm always checking the order of service to see yeah. what you're supposed to be doing because yeah. you don't want to upset people right at the be beginning of the service yeah. or kind of lose them. Yeah. But it's, and it, there are, as Helen said too, there are different ways of starting, different types of prayers. And, yeah. and sometimes even doing away with a prayer adoration and pretty much just doing a prayer of confession yeah. that sometimes is in unison or sometimes yeah. as the ministry says it or it, yeah. sometimes it goes on to great lengths of all the sins of the people which i think must be discouraging for the congregation and other times it's you know a very short part so there's nothing to set but it makes it interesting when you're traveling around the different churches i've got a book over here which came from the church of scotland from a layman person who was a very prominent layman in the Church of Scotland, and this was writing a book about oh, in the early 20s, and he was ref looking back to the evil. And what started was that you had the long prayer, and you were unadvised if the long prayer was more than half an hour. Uh, right, bang, off. And, uh, and uh, he suggested that it, that the ten. We always talk about the long prayers and talking, meeting Presbyterians later in different places. That's oh yeah, those long prayers. You know, long some of them go on at great oh, length. Yes, yeah. yes, 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 yes. I always like to remember one of the interesting things. Um, reading, I guess it's Tom Sawyer. I don't think it's uh, Uncle Finn, Anyway, uh, Tom Sawyer went to church, and if you look at the church service, undoubtedly it was a Presbyterian church, and the minister was doing his best, and he was praying for the various things in the, the, the state. But two things happened. One is that Tom had a beetle. That he was more interested in, and then his dog came up the aisle, mm -hmm. and, and between the dog and the and, and the beetle, uh, 
uh, the poor minister really didn't have much of a chance. But but uh, but uh, but the interesting thing to me is if you look at the at, at what was going on in the service. It, it, didn't sound Methodist, didn't sound Baptist, uh, but it, it it sure sounded like like a Presbyterian service. That's, yeah. what, what about the use of silence? And if you comment on that, we probably don't do it enough. We probably don't do it enough. I don't do it enough. And where would you do the silence, particularly? And it, it can happen in various places in the service. Well, I, I think you would have to, to set the scene. Like you would want to say a few words of adoration to get people's mm -hmm. minds on the right mm -hmm. track. But I just find it helpful in this church that I attend to. <laughs> um, when we, that the silence is there and we have our own pictures coming into our heads. And, but again, I think you need a maybe a, a bit of a. Well, I can think of I can think of services that I can think of that where where I've conducted a service in a summer cottage area, and everybody is set, settled down, and they just say, Ooh. Let us in, in silence and, and have, a, have a silence right before the, the service begins. The other place that I guess not irregularly is silence after confessions of sin or in, or in the confession of sin that we ourselves uh, confess our sins uh, and uh, so that's certainly a place where, um, where, where silence would. Uh, I was going to say, uh, I was going to say intrude, but no, it isn't intrusion. It uh, could be a, a real. Uh, it doesn't always work. Though I remember it, at my church, the um, the idea was you had a few moments to prepare yourself for worship, and yeah. the organ would play quietly. But people tended to want to visit. <laughs> Until one service, the organist stood up and hollered at everyone to, for heaven's sakes, keep quiet. I'm trying to play, you're supposed to be, you know, it didn't go over well. It didn't go over well. <laughs> <laughs> the, the other problem with that one is do you sit in silence to prepare yourself for adoration? Or do you play, do you sit and listen to the very fine? Uh, organ piece, and uh, and I suppose it works both ways. And uh, if you've got a good organist, if you, uh, in fact, and I know that a great deal of my good musical education came from going to church, and came to a, uh, in a congregation where there was first class music, and and I grew to love. Lots of wonderful music because it was uh, because it was a regular thing within the church. That's uh, and as we sang "Holy, Holy, Holy," there is music of adoration in adoration. But I know, as far as music is concerned, I I love Bach, and and he almost has persuaded me to be a Lutheran. Uh, I, uh, I, uh, is, uh, and and Calvin, Calvin's commentary on Psalm 33, you read his commentary, and he comments on Psalm 33, I think it's 33, that music in worship is part of the old covenant, which we, which we pass away from, when we become Christians, that that's part of the Old Covenant. And for the rest of the Book of Psalms, read, I don't think he comments on Psalm 150 at all. He certainly doesn't. There's nowhere after Psalm 33 that he does anything to commend music. And, uh, and uh, I think 
or what's his name who founded the Salvation Army? He had it right. <laughs> Luther had it right. And the, and the person who I blame for that kind of thing is not so much Calvin as uh, Singley and Bullinger. And I think Singley was an organist who destroyed the organs in the church. And, and Bullinger, I don't think, like music in the service at all, but Calvin was, was, a, was down the road and had to be, anyway, that was the way they were doing things. But anyway, that's, that, but music wouldn't have been. Well, I, I agree that, uh, well, the Geneva Psalm, Psalmbook, Psalms, yeah. which were set to music, which were designed to be sung in the home, yeah. uh, rather than church, because you don't sing in church, but he certainly encouraged people to sing. And, and, and did they get to, they, they would have been sung in the church, wouldn't they, the Psalms? I, I, I don't know. It's, Calvin was, was not, and, and my understanding, and this is from a lecture that I can't remember the source of, but the understanding was, uh, well, I'll frame it this way, is that I took Reformation history over at St. Mike's, and the professor in, for our opening devotions would always play a piece of music from the Middle Ages. And it has these beautiful octets and, you know, eight voices. Just, but I mean, Calvin was right. You can't make up the words because, you know, of all these voices swooping in and out. Uh, so that's, that was what I was taught was the context of, of, of Calvin. But he was very much in favor of people singing the Psalms six days a week. Yeah. And, and, and I mean, this, and you can see this elsewhere. I mean, Cromwell was a musician. But the question of, and I suppose the cathedral worship which from his point of view was not healthy. Uh, he, he didn't like, uh, he, I don't know. Anyway, music was, he, he was a Puritan in that regard and, and didn't, didn't. Did he not say that music distracts from God? But, but, okay, well, perhaps, perhaps he did. Yeah. And, that, and sometimes it does. Yes, and that, you, so that's why, um, it was all, it always had to be very simple and not within the church because music distracts from God. And you go to, and what I remember, uh, actually someone I knew who was a church musician who said, I never want to hear people say they come to church for the music. I want to hear them saying they go to church for God. Yes. It's interesting because uh, there's a debate in the Muslim uh, uh, yeah. community about the place of music, which is a problem in the schools. Uh, my son is a music teacher and some of the children are exempt from music class because yeah. it's not really music, it's not good. Yeah. But well, we already mentioned that kind of thing of, you know, the organist who said, you heard, you're not supposed to be chatting in church, you're supposed to be <laughs> preparing. The question is, are you preparing spiritually or are you listening to the music? And sometimes it's one, sometimes it's one. One thing that always bothers me is if after an anthem, the congregation claps, because I think that's just oh, yeah. so wrong. Yeah. You know, you're not, it's not a performance for our enjoyment, it's a... Uh, yes, yeah, so we're beginning to do that and... and and it's not, and you know, the the anthem gets gets applauded, but not the sermon. No, I had children's stories applauded, and again, I don't think it's right. I always threaten them that I'm going to make the sermon an extra hour and a half if they keep doing this sort of thing. You know, you can you can whip people into line one way or another. You don't get asked back, of course. But, you know. <laughs> Well, I'm trying to think of this Scottish minister who went to London and became, he founded the, he was a Church of Scotland minister for a very, the Catholic Apostolics, and he was sort of, he, he was sort of a Pentecostal Presbyterian, but when he went to the church in London as the minister, it was to be understood by all concerned that he had the use of four hours. But apparently he was a good enough speaker that anybody who wanted to lessons in allocution, they should go and hear them. Anyway, I think that that does the, uh, the, this first uh, so well, uh, I'll come to an end of this and in a minute we'll go on to the second. Okay, yeah. So you're welcome to stay.
stretch. It will be coffee a little bit later. There are goodies over there. Just this is a quick break, right? Ian? Yes. Yes. Uh -huh. And this one we owe you ten dollars for the book or oh, yeah. yes. one okay. Yes. Right. Yeah. Will he take checks? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna take it. Now if not, I'll take the other one. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
palpable so on the clothing, right? right? In the post of the eye, is that as yeah. the yeah. fact yeah. that yeah. we didn't have it so true. So when I got on the subway, I knew there was something was going on, but I didn't know anything about it. But I got to do it. I didn't know anything about it. So I know there's a lot of this. But I didn't say the whose story I was happening. I didn't know. I'm trying to get a topic. So by Wednesday noon, we had arranged in our location a service of auditation for Friday night. And I did that. I can show you this. I think we can see it. Only the first two I had in this community where there was a lot about the And that's why, if you were there, you know it. I mean, and then I go to the next hospital. And I'm talking to my colleagues. And they would come out. And Jay-Z was a fully traditional help. They would have these people. They didn't make any connection. They made the connection, but they didn't know how to do it. Because, you know, how to. Well, the lectionary. Well, the lectionary.
Every time I try to read Yoder now, it's messed up. I was um, taking a course at Treble, but all of that came to light, and it was very difficult times for a lot of the students because so many had studied with them. Mm -hmm. So it has to be a face to face. Dad's rules not mine. Well, you're out in that purpose? Yeah, she's out of jury duty. I couldn't even go and get out of so she got him. You could probably sell that letter. Wow. Oh. And she they said, okay. I got it for her. Yeah, I'm trying to use that for jury duty because she was supposed to find it yesterday. Mm -hmm. And it was all this organized crime stuff. I don't know. Murder and attempted murder. And she was hoping she wasn't going to be found. She seemed to inquire with her. So I don't know, one day she was going to find out if she stayed there. It was one of those ones where I think you have to have counseling afterwards. <laughs> so Lord be with you. Also also with you. With you. Lift up your hearts. Lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. Let's sing the hundred sound. And it's been the most sort of Sentimental and self-centered in ourselves and our world, 
But in prayer, we are just to God. We adore God because God is God. That's why we do the adoration. God is God. We bow before him. We adore God because God is God. And only later do we consider what he has done for us. It's when we lift our hearts in adoration that we can acknowledge our status before him. We fall short of God's glory. Let us read responsibly um, the first 10 verses of Psalm uh, 51. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love, according to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity, and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions, and my sin is ever before me. Against you, you alone have I sinned, and done what is evil in your sight, so that you are justified in your sentence and blameless when you pass judgment. Indeed, I was born guilty, a sinner when my mother conceived me. You desire the truth in the inward being. Therefore, teach me wisdom in my secret heart. Purge me with this, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness, but let the bones that you have crushed rejoice. Hide your face from my sins, blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and put a new and bright spirit within me. Let us bow in prayer. O Lord, we humble ourselves in your presence. We confess our unworthiness and our sin. We have come short of your glory. We have broken your law. We have not sought first your righteousness. We have been troubled about many things and have neglected the things that belong to our peace. We have not loved you with all our heart. We have not loved our neighbor as ourselves. We have done to others as we, we have not done to others as we would that they should do to us. Lord, have mercy on us. Christ, have mercy on us. Lord, have mercy on us. Hear the good news. Who is in a position to condemn? Only Christ. And Christ died for us. Christ rules for us. Christ reigns in power for us. Christ prays for us. Friends, believe the gospel. In Jesus Christ, in the field. May God, because God is God, it's a name when we lift our hearts in adoration that we can acknowledge our status before Him. We fall short of God's glory, and thus we confess our sins, the daily ins the indiscretions, and our utter failure to live as Christ wills. The words of absolution are spoken, but the real pronouncement of forgiveness is the preaching of the gospel. The words of absolution are spoken, but the real pronouncement of forgiveness is the preaching of the gospel, and it can be done by anyone. Any day, any hour, any place, live in Christ, and they receive forgiveness. 
and in the book here, there are a whole lot of, um, of the prayers of confession, and I can either list it off, but there, uh, there are a whole lot in the various, in all the services, there's a, a confession of sin. What is sin? Now, according in living faith, this is what was stated. We confess that we are sinners. We do not care for the world as we should. We do not fulfill our calling to serve God. Our lives do not reflect the Creator's love. Our failure is sin, a rebellion against God, and insistence that we be God in our own lives. God has given us the law to show us how to live. Yet we are unable to keep the Ten Commandments. We do not love God without reserve, nor our neighbors ourselves. And above all, our sin is exposed in the perfect life of Christ. Calvin commented that the law was a kind of mirror. When we look in a mirror, we see dirty marks on our face. So in the law, we're first made aware of our hopelessness and our sin and finally judgment. Through the law, we become conscious of our sin. In Calvin, there's quoting Romans. Luther, interesting, and, uh, in the larger catechism uh, said, let us then learn well the first commandment, that we may see how God will tolerate no presumption nor any trust in any other subject, and how he requires nothing higher of us than confidence from the heart of everything good, so that we may proceed right and straightforward and use all the blessings that God gives us. Actually, for the last month or so, I've been looking for a quotation from, from Luther that I can't find, but there, uh, there was a, one quotation from Luther uh, referring to the first commandment. Uh, and he said that there is no saint, no blessed person, no one who has ever lived who has fulfilled the first commandment, thou shalt have no other gods before me. Um, and uh, and the um, in the shorter characters of what is sin, in the transgression of or want of conformity to the law of God. And is it possible for anyone ever to keep the commandments? No, no mere mortal can keep the, the, uh, the, the Ten Commandments. So as um, uh, uh, but again, as we slide off adoration and service, we also tread gently on sin and forgiveness. Uh, and uh, uh, as adoration led to me into communion, um, sin and forgiveness leads me to baptism. Baptism is a living faith. Baptism is a sign and seal of our union with Christ and with his church, and through it, we share in the death and resurrection of Christ and our commission to his service. Baptism, uh, in baptism, water is administered in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. The water signifies the washing away of sin, the start of new life in Christ, the gift of the Holy Spirit. By the power of the Holy Spirit, God acts through baptism. It is the sacrament, not of what we do, but of what God has done for us in Christ. It's interesting, the Roman Catholic Church, as I understand it, teaches that baptism removes an original sin. And 
I don't think so. Um, but that's, I, I take it that that is the, is the Roman Catholic teaching with regard to, um, to, to uh, original sin. Um, the other day, just by chance, I picked up a copy of the of an Anglican prayer book, and and uh, read what the thirty nine articles say about original sin. Original sin standeth not in the following of Adam, as the Pelagians do really talk, but it is the fault and corruption of the nature of every man that naturally is engendered of the offspring of Adam, whereby man is very far gone from original righteousness and is of his own nature inclined to evil, so that the flesh lusteth always contrary to the spirit, and therefore is every person born into this world, it deserveth God's wrath and damnation. And this infection of nature doth remain Yea, and then that are regenerated, whereby the lust of the flesh called, uh, uh, called in Greek, <laughs> phronoma sarkos, which some do expound as wisdom, some as sensuality, some as affection, some the desire of the flesh is not subject to the law of God. And there is no condemnation for them that believe and are baptized. Yet the apostle doth confess that concupiscence and lust hath of itself the nature of sin. Actually, I think that's a better definition than you find in the short catechism or in the, uh, in the uh, uh, confession of faith. But interesting, uh, I have been one of the people that I referred to in looking these things up. One, one was a book by um, <coughs> Bozak. Alan, Alan Bozak uh, was a South African theologian uh, who was very much concerned with liberation theology and was writing what, what, what it was prior to uh, what happened in, in South Africa. And he had a sociological study about black theology and black power, which doesn't need to concern us at the moment. But his special concern to the mind today but the background of the theme was a false presumption of innocence. Uh, I, was, I, said, I, cannot, uh, I cannot endorse the Roman Catholic teaching that baptism removes the original sin. Original sin persists in us, is in us all. I don't know whether any of you have read any, anything of Chris Hedges. Chris Hedges was an American foreign correspondents uh, uh, did a lot of writing for the papers from the Middle East, but then became a Presbyterian minister in the United States. And in one of his books, he quoted Sigmund Freud on the human condition. Human beings, this is Freud, human beings are not gentle creatures who want to be loved and who at most defend themselves if they are attacked. They are, on the contrary, creatures among whose instinctual endowments are to be reckoned a powerful share of aggressiveness. As a result, their neighbor is for them not only a potential helper or a sexual object, but also someone who tempts them to satisfy their aggressiveness in him, to use him sexually without consent, to seize his possessions, to humiliate him, to cause pain, to torture, and kill. And Chris Hedges went on to, to comment on an ancient writer that we live in a permanent state of war, that man is a wolf to man. Uh, and I think in that he was including women. Um, aggress this aggressiveness is as natural to us as breathing. It's in our bones. If not our breathing, call it a manifestation of original sin. 
that had manifested itself in early childhood and advanced old age. And that's why I think that the promise of forgiveness is appropriate at an infant's baptism. But I'm sure that most of us in the global baptismal service aren't really thinking of the forgiveness of sin. It's a nice thing to do. It's a, it's a case where we present the child and before, before the congregation, but before God, and ask God's blessing on, on, on the child. I'm sure we do that. But how baptism uh, has to do with the uh, uh, with sin and forgiveness is something that uh, that we, uh, we tend to that we, we tend to forget. Now, what, to, what what what's the reaction now to the concept of original sin? Now it's interesting. They, they, they the Anglicans say it's not. Uh, um, it, it's not because we're descended from Adam. It's just born in us. Uh, whereas, uh, and it's interesting they say it, blame the Pelagians for. Uh, I don't often hear that quote very often, but and I didn't know quite how it fitted with them. But the fact is that. Um, uh, it's it's not because we affirm an Adam way back there. It's because there's something in us, in you, in me, in you, that uh, it's there. Do you agree? I mean, how do you counter that with God the Creator who made us male and female and saw it and it was good? And what came after? Oh. <laughs> well, of course, the, the phrase that Augustine used that we still say is you know, everyone's full sin is in there simultaneously. The one who says they have no sin is a liar. Yeah. That's what Paul says. And I believe. Well, and uh, you don't have to interact with people for long. But is that a part of our freedom as human beings? Our freedom to choose the other way in our freedom. But that's the general concept that we think of. And, and you know, we talk about, you know, so and so, and you know, there's two bad and there's all these innocent children. And, and, and of course, we talk about the courts, and somebody is pronounced innocent. Of course, the courts never say that somebody is innocent. They have not found a person guilty. That doesn't mean that they are innocent. And, and that, of course, is one of the problems of the law, that it um, isn't able to grasp, to, uh, to, to grasp the deeper sense of things that, uh, but, uh, okay. but how, how do we how do we in the modern world contemplate the, the, the phrase original sin and what you would you would want to forget you would want original sin to be uh, put away no i think it's our tendency to uh, for our own selfishness. That's how I would understand original sin, that we all have it. We all have a tendency to to favor ourselves over God, over our neighbor. I, I actually would go further than that. I think it's wanting to be God. Yeah, that's what I think. Yeah. When you said, when you talked about how the first commandment, first thing that came is, the, is uh, thou shalt have no other gods before you. I thought the, the God that I have probably more than any other is myself. I put myself first. Yeah, yeah. And that's, shall we say natural? 
but even in our churches, the Hymn Society about seven or eight years ago did a survey of the most popular hymns, and the top three all had the singer singing as if they were God, like the congregation was God. <laughs> and those were the top three hymns. <laughs> it's interesting in the Anglican Church, in the Anglican Book of Common Prayer, the normal thing is that you begin before the common prayer and if you look at the book of common prayer uh, they might read the ten commandments now nowadays they, they, they even the book of common prayer they don't read the ten commandments but they do um, you love the Lord of God with all your heart and, and, and your neighbor is yourself not well so that's what they do before they look before the pronouncement of uh, forgiveness um, but in the book of alternative services, there is a right of reconciliation that is over on that page. But the but the communion service in the book of alternative services doesn't doesn't mention the law, uh, and that surprised me. Uh, I. Uh, some good stuff in the Book of Alternative Services and some not so good. And, uh, but, uh, but, the, but they uh, have dropped that. Uh, uh, and I've been, to, I've been to lots of Anglican communion services and I don't know that I've ever been at one at which the Ten Commandments uh, are read. And the other thing is, I know of one church in St. John's, Newfoundland, a United Church, that has on the wall two great tablets of the Ten Commandments. And I don't know of another church, I haven't been in any other church in recent times, where uh, certainly none, none, none with anything like that prominence but even uh, but they don't they basically don't show uh, the, the, the ten commandments are not are very seldom um, placed um, in, in people's faces and yet of course you drive along the street and you see a sign and the sign has the symbols of the ten commandments on it and it's best the human bells this is uh, a sign in Hebrew. And you don't know if, but, but that's so that, uh, 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 I, and I don't, uh, mind you, I don't know what in Jewish practice the Ten Commandments, uh, what status, there's a sense of that it's status, what they do, but the, 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 there's no question that the that a Jewish. Uh, 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 place of worship and that kind of thing. The, the, the Ten Commandments are not very far away. Of course, they've got how many commandments? And they, the super Orthodox one of them. I didn't know the number, but it's rather, rather huge. How many? 516. How many? 516. 516. Yeah, that sounds better. Yeah, 300 is I thought you were wrong. 516 and and you know my hair my hair is I don't know what what do they do with the bald man anyway but that's another matter but the fact is that um, I would presume in a lot of our churches that the Ten Commandments have sort of dropped from consideration in um, Switzerland and Reformed churches in Switzerland and France, I've seen the Ten Commandments very prominently displayed yeah. in the churches. Yeah. Yes, yes. And there were times when it was not that unusual, and it did happen in Canada. Mm -hmm. But the, but it's uh, but I would think in most of our churches, and I would think most of our Sunday schools, and most of uh, of what we do, I would think the Ten Commandments are not. Uh, are not drilled into people, but but um, you know what's 
Why bother? What do we what do we want for them? And the other thing, of course, is that at an earlier generation, um, civil law would have traced its its arising out of such concepts as the Ten Commandments. And I think nowadays the civil law is deliberately um, based on nothing else but the Act of Parliament, whatever the Act of Parliament is, that, uh, and the, the Act of Parliament that <coughs> no longer recognizes the Ten Commandments. I think it's an, an unwillingness to recognize the origins of a lot of our laws as well. I, I do that, okay. Like a deliberate unwillingness to to say that it's a, you know, they're based on Christian principles. Yeah, well, uh, yeah, it's, uh, I would be interested to know just well, what the legal position mm -hmm. is there. The, uh, and of course, you know, the, the neatest piece of jurisprudence that laid aside any Christian the foundation was the uh, was Chief Justice McMurtry's decision on uh, on marriage, and he said that the common that the law of marriage or that they cited uh, that was part of the common law was a man and a woman married, and Chief Justice McMurtry said that this was a Christian concept, which, which was no longer necessary, and we would define uh, marriage as the union of two persons. We didn't say why two, but anyway, that's, a, that's another, but anyway, but that, was, but that was quite clearly where he saw that in the common law, there had been an acknowledgement of, uh, of, of this truth. And where the, the law of, that is now there divorces itself deliberately um, uh, from Christian groups. But I think that, you know, we're not that keen to acknowledge the original sin. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The fact that there's a wolf in this is, um, I don't know. Actually, um, uh, Alan Bozak refers to war as a drug, uh, which, and, and Alan Bozak is somebody who's uh, been in some of the worst places in the last 20th century, the last, 20th, the, the, the last generation, uh, and seen all kinds of glory, I guess. And I don't know whether he still, uh, uh, whether he still, whether he still has a congregation. But he is, uh, uh, he is uh, and, and, and a Presbyterian congregation uh, that, uh, that he's. Uh, I mean, he, and of course, he, he was the one who quoted that from um, uh, from Freud, and uh, there was a program on the CBC a few weeks ago, I think it was of the commentator on Sunday morning, and he had been dealing with an American black pastor and who remarked on the fact that racism is in us. And, and, and it's there, and he sees no sign of how it can be can be erased. My my own self, I have thought, looking for, for the twentieth century, I would have said the big, huge sins were what one was genocide, and two is racism. And genocide, we've got. Horrible examples of it, and I suppose it's still going on. Um, racism, everybody's got it. We don't talk about Eskimos because Eskimo was a term used by one of the 
First Nations people talking about people who didn't cook their food. And I've forgotten, I didn't know at one point, the Inuit word for what the people who call Indians. And they were people who had licensed hair. But that, uh, um, this business of, uh, of one group against another, it's here in town. It, um, when I can remember, my father was a surgeon at the Sick Children's Hospital. One of the things he was delighted with was when the Sick Children's Hospital moved from College Street down the University of Avenue. And there was one very interesting thing there in with regard to the moon. That's the piece of land they wanted, and they thought that was the best place to get it. And so they negotiated. And the Sick Children's Hospital was required to, it was allowed to have the land on the condition that Jewish doctors would be able to practice in the Sick Children's Hospital. Uh, and, and I suppose that in the Sick Children's Hospital now, they've got a blank, you know, whoever you are, uh, come. But uh, I mean, that kind of thing is in, in our society, and it's there. Well, University Hospital on one side of the street, got Sinai on the other. Why is there a Jewish hospital? Because it's a certain stage there had to be. Yes. Yeah. And now I presume the Mount Sinai it takes uh, uh, takes whoever shows up at the door. I know they do. And, and but it's but this kind of thing that uh, is there within the society and in Canada. The racial line between black and white is it's there, but nothing like what it is in the States. And I suppose that in North America, there is, you're, you're Asian, or you've got Asian roots, and there is difference. Yes. You know? And I'm sure that among Asian peoples, there are definite lines. No, we just get along. Oh, <laughs> Fred! That's why Kim is going to try. <laughs> I know what you're talking about. The Tibetan, the Tibetans love the Chinese. The Tibetans love the Chinese. I really don't think it's born in us. Like I think it's learned because in our tribal days. It was a fear of the other, like another group, any other group. They were there to take over our land or take our women or, or our men or you know, whatever the deal was. And so you, you grew to be wary of people who were different, spoke a different language, had different customs. But I think it's learned because certainly now in mixed race families, and my own family now is one of them, there's none of that feeling. Like I think things are certainly different and um, I know, um, I mean, I taught school for a lot of years, like I didn't see, diff you know, you, so you don't see difference. Um, so I don't, I really don't feel, I mean, it's certainly racism is there and it's a very big problem, but I, I think it's learned from reactions from your parents and other people. So. It, it's subtle. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes it's masked a little bit. I think we might be more uh, honest or talk about it when others are not around, and maybe in the confines of just if you're talking with your husband, wife, as a joke, maybe you would say it. Uh, some things that you would never want anybody to hear in public if we're honest. And, uh, but it's, uh, I don't know, I mean, it, it can happen in many different ways. It, it, I mean, my wife was at a think tank last week because they were trying to make some park space. And my wife, uh, she works as a, uh, at a wheelchair uh, seating clinic. And uh, so two of the um, Caucasian folks that were there that day, they kept talking about how they were privileged. 
And so we kind of had that breakfast, and we don't, we don't always talk about things like this, a breakfast that was our topic today. And we said, what do they mean by privilege? Uh, so this idea that if you're white, you're privileged, uh, it can sort of sound uh, in a way of, is it pride and arrogance a little bit, that if you're white, uh, that you are privileged, or are they thinking that we should give back? So exactly what do they mean by privilege? And one person said as a caveat to what they were saying, and another person who was Caucasian said the same thing again as a caveat uh, to what they were going to talk about. And I'm thinking, what does that got to do with what we are going to talk about in subject at that time? And so, um, uh, and once again, uh, you know, I'm hearing it uh, as a third person, and so exactly what they intended, what they meant, I don't know. But are all white people privileged? Are we talking about economically? Because there are a lot of white people who also suffer, right? And I, I don't think someone, you know, occasionally say, I am living it up. Uh, but then we have a lot of people from Middle East, uh, Asians, uh, who are, you know, kids driving around in Bentleys and, you know, cars that I'll never drive or do I want to drive, but they're driving at the age of 18 and 19. So the word privilege, you know, what does it really mean? But I think what I'm hearing, uh, and I could be wrong, I doubt it, but what I'm hearing is when they said privilege, they set the standard, right? So what they're accustomed to, what they're used to, uh, and typically from a European background, and that format is the standard. And and so, it doesn't apply to uh, Han Chinese uh, dealing with, 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 with other European uh, well, people? By the way, I'm, so, I'm from South Korea. Okay. So okay. Chinese is Chinese to me. Yeah. Uh, I, I, you know, I wouldn't understand a sing, uh, single word of Chinese. Uh, and, and so it, it's not like French and English where some words you can make it up. Um, like I hear Chinese, I don't, I can't recognize a single thing they're saying. Yeah, it's it's just day and night. Yeah. Uh, and so um, mannerisms, maybe perhaps, but I don't feel when I'm with them an affinity like, oh yeah, they're, they're talking my, you know, cultural language and so forth. It just feels very different, uh, even though. Uh, we might have shared some heritage in the background, but um, you know, racism, it doesn't have to be like slavery and that, but it could go even in a church, for example. So the kind of worship, the prayer, the way we do it, what is the right standard? Yeah. Right? But the church is from a different parts of the world who comes in, and it's, it's a challenge because now people in Canada, especially in a city like Toronto, they're from everywhere, and if you have a makeup that's not so homogeneous, but it becomes more multicultural, then that kind of challenges once again the way we used to do things in the Presbyterian Church. And so, and when you said before about perhaps not, um, they're more forthright. And I don't know what group you were referring to in the racism and that. You're right, perhaps that we are not as racist in Canada as in the states. I think our racism is far more insidious because it's far, it's, it's hidden, it's under layers. And it's not, you know, it's the, the, the old joke of some of my best friends are Jewish. Or, you know, that so <laughs> whole, um, we, we like to think we're nice and polite. And so, which we are. But, we, <laughs> but because of that, it's, we're not as honest about our racism, I don't think, mm. as... A place in the states which says yeah jim crow was a good thing you know it's just they're very blunt about it and i i don't think we are and i don't i don't know which is worse but do you think we should be i think i'd like to see racism gone i'm just saying i don't know which is worse mm -hmm. being insidious and yeah uh, well it certainly makes it easier to get along that way sure. yes but you know, then but, being out and out yeah, yeah. But I, was, I get what you're saying, though, yeah. but it doesn't get addressed. Yeah. It, it just gets hidden. Yeah. So underneath the surface, it's still there, and yeah. it doesn't need to get addressed because you're being civil and uh, yeah. on the surface level, you think that you're accepting each other, but you're really not. Right. Yeah. And, and what about the Aboriginals here, Canada? Yes, we've been horrible about that. Yeah. And, and, and we are being horrible. Yeah. We are being horrible. Uh, although, uh, well, I think of a, an Indian community that I used to have a period of contact with, and 
very decent people, good to them. They were, but, but uh, that was dealing with the business and what the rest of the what, what the rest of that community. But nonetheless, uh, it's but I, and I would think there are I mean, a lot of places in in Canada where the economic situations of the Aboriginals can be very bad. Although they're sometimes very good. You know, some some Aboriginal people, tribes in British Columbia or Alberta are very wealthy. Oh, very wealthy. But uh, but but they deal with it as it is. Uh, how how we deal with them and how they deal with us. One of the things you find though is, uh, I think it goes to the point of what, what is privilege to that common privilege. It's nice, it's nice that, you know, our group has oil and that we can you know, send all of our kids to university. But how are those kids going to take painful rate are going to be treated when they get to university by people? But, but anyway, all the way along here, we're, we're talking economics and sociology. We're, we're not talking. Um, we're not talking about sin and forgiveness. But the, I, I think the issue of of, of othering and, and saying what the comment here. Uh, but I mean, othering is you know there's a context of it. It's taught. But there is a context of it that's innate. It doesn't. The, the, the state of othering comes naturally. And, and, and socially, it's just channeled. It's not, it's not created, it's just channeled. What about relationships within the church? And I was going to right now, I was going to refer to Amos and the fact that the sins of the nations and the sin of Israel and the sin of Judah. But the sins of uh, no. But anyway, here's it. What about in the churches? Gracious God, the love of Christ compels us to ask forgiveness for 
perpetuating growth and community in the among our churches, we humbly pray. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. We confess our intolerance. Gracious God, the love of Christ compels us to ask forgiveness for banishing our brothers and sisters from shared moments in the past and for acts of religious intolerance today. We humbly pray. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. We confess our divisions. Gracious God, the love of Christ compels us to ask forgiveness for living our Christian lives, divided from one another, and from our common calling for the healing of all creation. We humbly pray. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. We confess our isolation. Gracious God, love of Christ compels us to ask forgiveness for the times we have isolated ourselves from our Christian sisters and brothers and from the wider communities in which we live, we humbly pray. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. We confess our pride. Gracious God, the love of Christ compels us to ask forgiveness for our pride. We humbly pray. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Let us pray. Gracious God, the Lord upon these walls that we have built, which separate us from you and from one another. Forgive our sins, heal us, and help us to overcome all the walls that keep us apart. Teach us to turn from our illicit ways. Make us one in you. Amen. And that is in the, that was in the service of uh, joint service. In the Roman Catholic uh, Church in, in St. John's. And that is a question of um, reflecting on the sinfulness of our relationship among denominations. That kind of thing. And there's sometimes in it, I thought to myself, I don't know, but, but, but we, I guess we're getting better at it. And certainly the Pope's getting better at it. The Pope says, discuss it. Discuss with everybody. And uh, he's got a lot to discuss. <laughs> and, and so we all. But the question on divisions within the, within the body of Christ are uh, part of the things that, that, are, that require confession and forgiveness. I was going to sing a hymn, but we've gone too far. And so we'll, we'll be at the end of this, and we'll be back in a few minutes. Well, there is probably music distracts from God. Occasionally, <laughs> 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 we need this. Well, you're, you are familiar with Luther's line, aren't you, about sin boldly and trust in the grace of God more boldly? Oh, yes. I love that. I came from, we can't help but sin. So sin boldly and we will trust in the yes. grace of God. I've heard it said that all my prayers are thanks. I took your talk and just wanted to expand. Yeah. Because I think there is, I think, a king for our tribal beginnings. So we have to be careful. Well, it's great. I mean, I think I was thinking of always think that, you know, our human self is so strong. We put ourselves in Christ to combat. We always do side something. You know, these neighbors move in. You know, it's not the MS. I know. I was going to say, okay, this yeah, somebody the 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 door. Door. Yeah, like with <laughs> the, the, the gentleman that really his hand, you know, I was well, saying that to somebody took it downstairs. You know, we call me. Some of the.
This last discussion would have fit in well last night. Yeah. And I can use that for the August series on the Lord's Prayer. I don't have a copy. I need your copy. Can I do the forgiveness week? The August, the series on the Lord's Prayer. Thank you, Peter. Peter would be so vindicated. Would Peter be vindicated right now? Watch the pen. Like, he would be so vindicated. Yes. No, and I, this prayer, I actually was trying to, when we were saying it here at the end of finally in my head, because I think that really would enhance it. That hearing it antiphonally, I think, would really enhance it. It's written antiphonally. They told me I could transfer. Yeah. Uh, yeah. A very lofty completion uh, of the book. Uh, I couldn't hear from what you were reading. I think it would be enhanced to read it and to talk only. I can help drink. So I I would think we could write it and that it would just be a really good asset to it. So there's a position establishing. Yeah. 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 Well, Peter's asked, yeah. and we haven't had one yeah. in a few Sunday series yet, and it is August. Yeah. So, so probably it will be different. And Wednesday will be lighter. And and it will be to start the informer. Uh, and, 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 and you are the teacher. So, teaching yeah. Yeah. So, and, so, that's, I mean, this, this, you know, I look at the, what is the, the, uh, the, 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 I'm still looking for a I'm but when he says the six hundred, it's water. No, I don't show it. I always So it's so So it's so So it's and when I don't am I good? I when it was bad yeah, and then, uh, yeah, so I said to him, um, I heard it, it takes me twice as long to get everything pressed as it does to actually get the picture. Because we also, we Yesterday, but one of our church members, like a bunch of us, did lunch yesterday. Uh, we were, 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 we were,
so the rain is pouring out of us. The rain is one thing. Yeah. yeah. So when are you getting a stop? Uh, uh, yeah, so I can't. I'm like, oh, 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 I'm
but it's just my loyalty is just a little bit more. I
get on the things and we'll handle it again too. When you call it all of me and I will call it all of me. Will you let my love be shown? Will you let my name be known? Will you let my life be grown in you and you in me? Will you leave yourself behind if I would call your name? Will you care for cruel and kind and never be the same? Will you risk a loss of sin? Should your life of trap or scare? Will you let me answer prayer in you and you in me? Will you let the light and see if I would call your name? Will you set the prisoners free and never be the same? Will you give some and to such as this unseen, and this to what I mean in you and you in me. Will you love the you you hide if I but call your name? Will you quell the fear inside and never be the same? Will you use the faith you found? To reshape the world around, to have sight and touch and sound in you and you in me. For your sound and echoes true when you but call my name. Let me turn and follow you when there would be the same. In your company I'll go. When your love and footsteps show, thus I'll move and live and grow in you and you in me. Let us pray. O oh God, you have committed to your people the privilege of prayer on behalf of your people. Hear our prayers for your church and your world. O Lord Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever, pour out your spirit upon the church that it may preach the gospel anew to each succeeding generation. May it interpret your message for the life of every age with words which fulfill the highest hopes and deepest needs of every nation. In all times and places, may your sons and daughters find in you their Lord and Savior. Amen. This book is offered to those conducting public worship, both ministers and laity. The book of a book of services may still be an, a, useful in an age when the internet commands everybody's attention. The services offered have an origin, their origin, in a congregation of the Presbyterian Church of Canada, but much of the material here is not especially Presbyterian. The prayers are drawn from a wide mosaic of Christian worship in many denominations and many countries. Many ministers, quite properly, compose their own prayers for public worship. Some spend more hours in preparing prayers <coughs> than in writing sermons. Some pray in public without written preparation. But this can only be done properly after real time and meditation. Perhaps some of the prayers in this book may assist such a reflection. Because, of course, you read the prayer, you don't have to use that prayer, but it may assist you in planning a prayer of your own. 
um, and, uh, and certainly I would think that they can be of help to lay folk who are uh, application to lead in prayer. But as you see, when I told you about Jean's prayer, it's, there are all kinds of prayers that can be of, of help somewhere. This book is the enlargement of a small volume. Yeah, this is the, this was a small book that I put together in, uh, in, in, and eventually uh, grew from that uh, to this. But uh, the last, when I went to St. John's, it was just the time when there was liturgical ferment in all the churches and suddenly the language of worship changed. God is now addressed by the pronoun you. And we used to uh, announce, we talked to God as thou. Uh, the people of God are clearly recognized as female and male. And the language of prayer has to make this clear. That's we done. And, 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 and I think those things we've carried through all right. The basic shape of the liturgy, and one of the things I'm concerned is, is the shape of the liturgy, the shape of the service. And, uh, and the, but the shape basically hasn't changed. The rich heritage of devotional literature from many branches of the Christian church was a steady resource. However, the language of prayer had to be adopted for modern usage and uh, local uh, suitability. Um, who was the lunch? It was for, for Andrew Irvine. Uh, and Andrew Irvine? Yes, okay. Andrew Irvine criticized me because in one of the prayers I used beseech. Clyde, Clyde Irvine, not Andrew. Oh, oh, it was Clyde. Oh, it was Clyde. Yeah, it was Clyde. Gotta get our critics right. <laughs> anyway, anyway. Uh, Jesus Okay, okay. Well, sorry, I don't know why. Okay. So beseech. He doesn't like beseech. But anyway, you, 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 there are occasions to use the word beseech, but not very often. Not very often. Um, the Sunday services without communion draw on prayers from many uh, sources. And seven are arranged for seasons of the Christian year, and one is a service of healing, one directly to our mission, one is no special. The, the first service, Advent, illustrates the spread of traditions, and the opening prayers are drawn from the Church of Scotland, and some prayers by Ruth Hope uh, with the modern uh, Advent hymns, themes of hope, joy, peace, and love. And two of the colleagues are translated from French prayers, but several of the prayers in the Christmas service are Karl Barth's prayers. Um, and, uh, uh, and the service after Christmas includes prayers from Presbyterian and Reformed sources in Canada, the United States, Great Britain, and concludes with three prayers from uh, uh, from a collection by George Appleton. Actually, I was going off and I realized I've got some extra books that I meant to show you here. And one person who I'm, I bet you haven't heard of George Appleton, but it's too bad. George Appleton at one point was an Anglican missionary in, uh, in what we call Burma. And then later he moved to Australia and I think he was the Archbishop of Perth, Western Australia. And I think he ended up, or close to ended up, as the Anglican Bishop in, in Jerusalem. But he had a, a worldwide vision of prayers. And he had prayers from, from the Far East, and he had prayers. From, and uh, any of the, I, I suspect that his books are not available now, but George Appleton was a was uh, in my early days, I thought I know the, the book I was going to show you, the back's pretty well off it. it, it uh, I, this was, uh, uh, but he was a, a very broad and wonderful uh, Anglican uh, 
uh, Bishop, but I've got, I've got several other books uh, of prayers uh, by him. And then there were, and there were, there were a number of collections of books. And what I, among other things, I'm encouraging people to get prayers of a wider, of a wider spectrum. Uh, and, uh, you know, well, I, I, I've got a good number of books on prayers that are not represented in this, but uh, one, of the, one of the sections where I was, I've got a quotation from the Roman Catholics have a little weekly, and they say certainly did, I suppose they do now, a little magazine. Well, it was a monthly little magazine, but smaller than this book almost. With, with prayers, and I, I, I used to see those, and sometimes we'd, we'd lift a prayer uh, from, from one of theirs uh, topically. Um, but uh, as I say, that the service after Christmas includes prayers from Presbyterian and Reformed Church, Canada, the United States, Great Britain, and concluded with three prayers by George Appleton. Several of the Linton, Linton prayers are adapted from C.H. Spurgeon, and Spurgeon was a Baptist in London who was a magnificent preacher and a magnificent prayer online. If you can get a book, if you've got something by Spurgeon, look at it there. Thank you, for, and, and thank you for coming. Thank you for having me. Sorry, I got to leave earlier. Thank you. Um, but the seat, the shape of all the Sunday services is the same. They begin with the adoration of God. And as I say, it's a common tendency for in worship for adoration and thanksgiving to be to, to, to meld together. And well, it's it's easy to do and natural to do, but they aren't quite the same thing. And and I have endeavored in here to on the whole to keep the adoration as adoration and 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 thanksgiving comes afterwards. Um, we adore God because God is God, and we are here with concerned reason. It's when we lift up our hearts in adoration that we can really acknowledge our status before Him. We fall short of God's glory. And thus we confess our sins for the daily indiscretions that our failure to live as God would have us. Um, the words of absolution are spoken. And you know, one of the things I was thinking about on our question of sin, how is sin forgiven? And sin is forgiven. By Christ, in Christ, in the cross of Christ. That's, that's the miracle. That whether it's original sin in our bones, or whether it's these indiscretions that we stumble over, we, we need that, that word. And so the question is, but as I say, that is the real proclamation of the uh, of forgiveness it has to be done in the preaching of the gospel, because the gospel is not just somebody standing up and saying we're forgiven, but our understanding of Christ, uh, uh, who is. And if you've got a service in which. Sin and forgiveness and who Christ forgiveness. If it's not there, it's. Uh, I, I've got some very good friends who are blessedly United Church people, but the kind of the kind of services they have, some of them is not. Anyway, but the same shape of the service is the same ones we confess our sins. And, and as I say, the service, the matter of the pronouncement of the gospel and the forgiveness of, of God in Jesus Christ is somebody that you can, it doesn't require 
Um, it doesn't require someone in robes, although someone in robes is there because, because he or she is there in an office to do a duty. And, uh, and we need we should not be ashamed of, of that. Frankly, I don't want essentially to be preached to by an insurance salesman. I don't particularly want to be preached to by, by a high school teacher. Well, the high school teacher may be a very good minister, may be very good. But when they're up there uh, and talking about it, they are fulfilling an office, which is not the office of, 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 the, of an ordinary school teacher. It's, uh, if you, it, unless, I mean, you're not a school teacher if you're, if you really are having a little worship. Okay, a school teacher. But uh, I would think that school teachers basically are not allowed nowadays to tell the gospel in church. I don't know what to do. You can get in trouble, I don't think. Sure can. What's that? Well, I guess I'm a school teacher and I preach every Sunday. But, um, you don't preach at school. But I don't preach at school, no. And sometimes I roll. Yes. I just wear academic regalia. Yes. You know, I don't have the call. Well, of course, actually, we all yeah. did. You know, we were and wore academic robes. Mm -hmm. uh, starting with Luther, I guess. Anyway, the, uh, but the center of the service is the reading of the scripture and the proclamation of the gospel. Now, a secondary purpose of the book was to reproduce all forms of worship where they illustrate the concerns often neglected. Uh, um, among these, uh, I, the, the service which I lifted from the prayer book of St. John's Church in Velour, India. Uh, and that's the service for of all saints and for the annual services uh, and its service number. Uh, yeah, it's, it starts on page 27. But the prayer uh, for, and they do what we forget to do. Uh, uh, we give thanks to God for the for patriarchs, prophets, apostles, the wise of every land and nation, for the martyrs of our holy faith, for the witnesses of Christ whom the world is not worthy, for all who have resisted wrong at the cost of suffering and death, for all who have labored and suffered for freedom, good government, good laws, the sanctity of the home, for all who have been tender and true and brave in all times and places, and for those who have been one with you in the communion of Christ's spirit. For teachers and companions of our youth and the members of the household of faith who worship you now in heaven. And for the grace that was given to them and for the trust and hopes in which they lived and died. But this is a, it was a long prayer in the service book, as I say, of St. John's Church, which is a, a, a church uh, of the Church of South India uh, in the end of the war. Uh, a little church there. Uh, that was that was one uh, thing that I was glad to have in. And the other one is that, uh, well, one, I love the communion service of the um, Presbyterian uh, Church in Canada's book uh, of 1922, which you, won't, you normally won't find. And the other one is a long prayer. Well, it's, well <laughs> I say a long prayer, <laughs> but uh, John Knox's prayer. Uh, where's John Knox's prayer now? Uh, did you see it? 104, I think. 104, okay. Oh, yeah. But John Knox's prayer for the um, uh, for the whole estate of the Christian church. That's where it says besiege. That's where you put besiege in. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> and we beseech you to direct and govern the hearts of all rulers. So it was John Knox, we should tell a lie. No, you didn't say yeah. that. John Knox. John Knox is a 21st old guy, but, uh, but he is. Don't mess with him. Yeah, yeah. And I'm sorry, I don't know where I must be up in the car. 
I had Jim Knox's prayer book here, and I was going to show it to you and that kind of thing. It's a couple of other books. That, uh, but anyway, a question of the, we, we seldom pray for the whole estate of the Christian church, which we do. One of the times that I've forgotten, I won't, anyway, there was a, a service at which the minister announced the congregation that he was going to be healed. And in the prayers of intercession, he didn't pray for the congregation. <laughs> I didn't like that. I didn't like that. He'd been there, he'd been the minister, he was the minister, and he was, he, he was leaving, going somewhere else. And he didn't even pray for the person. <laughs> no, anyway, that's been, that's, perhaps that's a tale of his solution. <laughs> but anyway, um, the words of absolution are, as a the real pronouncement of forgiveness is the preaching of the gospel. And as I say, the secondary purpose was to produce some of these, this is some of this type of prayer from all sorts of places. Uh, and, uh, uh, and we, uh, and I would encourage many people to pick up books of prayer from various places and and make use of them. Yeah, there. Um, and uh, it is God in prayer. Oh Lord Jesus Christ, the sick were brought to you, and you did not send them away without your blessing. Look with pity on those who come to you for healing of body or of mind. Grant them the blessing of your saving health. We name before you those who bow in pain, those with pressing illness, those with injury and handicap. We pray for healing this day. We name before you those burdened in mind, those suffering for depression, the disturbed, the disoriented, those burdened with fear and anxiety who lay their troubles before you. We name before you those in declining strength, those burdened with loss, those who are alone and friendless, those who are insecure in life and them, who cry unto you in their distress. Lord Jesus Christ, hear our prayer. Give healing, give relief, give comfort, and give peace. The prayers uh, also in the sort of supplication, and it's interesting, the little book from 1900 of the, of the prayers, it had a whole section on supplication, and I was going to point out that, but I didn't have it here, so that's, um, but um, uh, the question of prayer for ourselves, that God will send his blessing to us for today but for, for who we are and, and those who are around us. And we ask for your blessing there. Um, and we need to remember to pray for those who are leaders in our world who need wisdom from on high. And how they get wisdom from one another is, I don't know, that's very really different. Very really different. Yeah. And we live, in, we live in troublous times. And we pray that God will deliver us from troublous times. So. Let us pray. O oh God, who loves us as a mother loves her children, hear our prayer for your, our homes and families. Bless those whom we love. May our dwellings be fit places for your presence. Help us to live in peace with our dear ones. 
<clears throat> we may encourage one another in common tasks and enjoy our common pleasures. Come among us with your love and enliven us with your Holy Spirit. Blessed Lord, you have given us your love. In Jesus Christ, that love is extended to all. Grant unto us that we may spread your love in the world. Grant that through us that love may penetrate into all circles, all societies, all economic, political systems, all laws, all rulings. Grant that it may penetrate into offices and workplaces, into homes and institutions, into recreations and entertainment. Grant that it may penetrate the hearts of men and women. May we not forget that the battle for a better world is a battle of love in the service of your love. We pray for our nation, our provinces, our city, our guide with your spirit, those who lead our public life. Give them wisdom, honesty, discernment, that they may serve your people and give honor to your name. And to conclude, let us join in our Lord's Prayer. Our Father, our Father, our Lord, our Lord, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us the fair daily bread, and give us as we forgive those who do not yes. give us not to temptation, but to the rest from evil. For thine is the kingdom, power, and glory, forever and ever. Amen. Give us your blessing, O Lord, as we set out upon our ways. May your good providence shield us from danger. May your rich grace keep our souls from sin. And to you be glory in Christ forever and ever. Can we sing about a Bethel? 654. 